And good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Adam Davis. Welcome to episode 112, 112 of the 11FS Fintech Insider Breakfast Show. Uh, as you know, in the show, we bring you the best and the brightest from the fintech industry and banking landscape every single weekday, straight to your homes, 8.30 BST, apart from on Mondays and Wednesdays when we go live at 3.30 BST or 10.30 AM ET for our US friends and both shows as we all know go live here on LinkedIn. Uh, today's topic is large banks starting to think like fintechs when it comes to innovation and joining me is Matt Phillips who's the VP and Head of Financial Services in the UK and Ireland for Diebold Nixdorf. Uh, Matt thanks so much for joining me this morning and uh, ha happy Friday. Indeed yeah thanks for having me on this morning. Uh, no worries where are you uh, dialing in from? So uh, sunny Reading uh, this morning, so uh, which is bucking the trend for the last couple of days. So great to yeah. be part of the show today. Oh, good. Um, sounds good. Um, as ever, uh, if you've got comments, if you've got uh, questions, please leave them in the, uh, the sidebar and we will get to them uh, later on in the show. Um, first up, Matt, do you want to just give me sort of a brief, brief background in terms of your role, I guess, responsibilities uh, and the kind of work obviously you guys do over at DM? Yeah, happy to do so. So um, I'm a, a team member of one of nearly 22,000 people around the world that support uh, both financial institutions and, and retail customers on a daily basis, helping them bridge their, their physical and digital channels with, um, with a, you know, a great um, breadth of solutions, uh, which effectively helps them engage with their end customers uh, on a daily basis. So as you quite rightly said, I'm responsible for the financial services side of that coin um, and specifically responsible for our customer engagement and our business here in the UK and Ireland. And I guess um, like from, I mean, COVID is such a, uh, has been such an all-encompassing all, all topic, if you like, obviously over the last few weeks, but especially when you look at the way that banks operate uh, and you look at digital services, you know, a lot of banks are talking about how they've sort of overcome two, three years of a potential digital roadmap in the space of about three or four months. Um, I think from your perspective, like before we sort of go micro on the macro scale, are um, have you seen like significant trends uh, changing over the past few months, uh, specifically in relation to financial technology and how your clients are using are using the the systems that you provide yeah i think um as you quite rightly said adam the, the pandemic has has really accelerated and forced them to you know to to really focus very much on their digital channels uh, and their online and mobile channels for good reason because clearly um we in many parts of the world have been locked down and confined to our, our own homes but i think um what we have seen and whilst we've seen that surge in digital traffic we haven't really seen that surge in digital traffic for, I guess, the more meaningful transactions. So being able to check your balance, being able to make a payment, that's all great. And of course, those types of transactions have, have surged. But anything more meaningful, what we have seen is either customers waiting to, you know, to maybe go back into a branch to speak to someone face to face, or indeed, you know, just perhaps trying to transact in a different way, uh, which kind of bucks the trends as, as, as us as, you know, I guess, um, consumers of other services. So when we look at things like video streaming, you know, across the de the demographics we have in the UK and Ireland, we've seen a surge across all, all parts of that demographic. But for, for I'd say, digital banking services, we haven't seen the, the same level of, of uptake. That's interesting. And then um, I suppose, what do you... Um, you know, recently, and it's very recently, some of the rules and, uh, have obviously been relaxed in society, so you can go back out. Um, have you seen any significant shift, like in the last month or so, in terms of, um, oh, we seem to have lost Matt. He will be back very shortly. Um, let's just wait up, oh, and Matt I'm is back. back. Look Sorry. at that. Quick transition. I was just, I was going to, uh, I was going to refer to the last, let's say, the last month in terms of um, how, uh, I guess, how, it, how have you seen a shift as we have relaxed the COVID lords in society? Have you seen any shifts that that you can specifically pinpoint to that relaxation and say, oh, we've seen that through our technology stack, you know, technology stacks. We can definitely see a difference in usage or in surges of of certain types of functionality. Yeah, so we've seen naturally as as people have been uh, able to travel a bit more freely, we've seen, you know, an increase in the use of self service and and clearly an in, an increase in the use of the physical channels but i think you know equally what we what we're foreseeing is a uh, an absolute demand from the consumer to say look you know can we have something that's a bit more joined up here that if 
in the event there is another pandemic and we're at home, I can do lots more than perhaps I can today. Um, and I think that's where, you know, companies like ourselves really, you know, play to the fore in terms of helping helping those banks bridge those physical and digital channels a bit more seamlessly than perhaps they're able to do so today. Yeah, that's a good shout. And then um, I guess um, uh, in terms of uh, banks thinking like fintechs, because, mm. you know, it, it was one of the, uh, obviously um, it's 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 what we're here to talk about. But I'm, I'm really keen to get your view on of the clients that you've uh, that you work with. How many of them, I guess, um, say that they work like a fintech or operate like a fintech, but actually use financial technology like a fintech? And mm. in, in that respect, I don't mean the actual uh sort of the software that they're procuring from you guys or from other vendors. I meant more around the way that their organizations are set up to be able to actually implement that software in the right way. Yeah, great great question, Adam. Um, so I think we have to start start and, and just sort of remind ourselves that, you know, banks spend a, a hell of a lot of money on a on an annual basis on probably back-end infrastructure, making sure that, you know, the transactions that we undertake with them are safe and secure because as we've seen, um, you know, where that, I guess, element of trust, where that gets broken, um, you know, it's, it's front page news uh, the very ne next morning and, and clearly has an impact on, on customer loyalty. Um, I think there's an equal focus on probably the theme and the right word is agility. And that's where the fintech space really does come into play with certainly with, uh, you know, the big banks that we know and love in the UK and Ireland. They, they're absolutely driven to try and become more agile um, even given their, their size and scale. And that's where they reach out to companies like ourselves to say, you know, we've got perhaps certain restrictions in terms of the infrastructure they have today. How can we help them by perhaps abstracting some of those more agile solutions from their own infrastructure and, and using our own teams to plug into that infrastructure, but still maintain that, that you know, absolute regulatory compliance, but most importantly, offer more, more agile services to their customers, whether it's personal banking customers like you and I, or whether it's it's you know your small and medium business customers that have very different needs, but equally, you know, very much want to engage with the banks the way that they see fit. So um, I think we're seeing a lot of demand in in that space, Adam, moving forward. Yeah, I was going to say, um, just picking up on a point you mentioned there about uh, the, the sort of the regulatory impact of of going quickly and 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 how much I guess it uh, it either helps or hinders um, you know the, the way that you operate. Do, do you think that um, it, it's sort of an, a now sort of a dated excuse to say, well, actually, you know, we can't get the best out of what we you know the systems we've got, or we can't go as quickly as fintechs because you know we've got to adhere to X Y Z regulation, or do you do you think that it's still like it, it's still a valid uh, is still a valid excuse, if you like, from you know tier one, tier two institutions to say, actually, well, you know what, we we, we would love to go as quickly as that, but oh, and Matt's dropped again. Let's hope for as quick a turnaround as we had last time. It is as quick a turnaround as we had last it, time. It is, yeah. No, I, I, I got the, I got the question there, Adam, before oh, I, I knocked out. So, um, yeah, I, I think um, look, you know, the regulation roadmap is is pretty well defined. Um, and it's very much, you know, laid out um, years in advance. So things like payment regulation, things like, you know, processes and, and, and indeed sort of compliance from a security perspective. Um, and, and I think, you know, as we all know and familiar with with sort of cyber things going on day in, day out, you know, that the spend that banks need to make in that area is, is probably only going to increase um, as time progresses. And as I said earlier, I think, you know, this is this is a great um uh, reason why you know bringing fintechs like ourselves into the fore to say look you know why don't you think about this in a slightly different fashion you focus very much on your core infrastructure and what's important to you and fundamentally that is how do they engage with their customers so our engagement um, from a Devold Nixdorf perspective is you know let us take some of that tech burden away from you if you like let us try and you know bring that agility into the into the um, into your environment, help you engage with customers in a different way, um, and look if it if we can do it perhaps quicker, simpler, and maybe even cheaper than they can do themselves. Then, and I think that's a good place to be. But fundamentally, we all have to remember here that it's the it's the end consumer uh, that we're all trying to uh, meet their needs, um, and you know those customer journeys are very much how we're focused and how we drive our engagement uh, you know, to, to 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 encourage that investment. 
Yeah, and just on the the, the topic of cost, because that's quite an interesting point. I mean, again, given COVID and given the way that people are banking now, some of the shifts that we've seen, it might not make actually such a tangible difference in terms of the amount of investment being made, because you still need to invest in infrastructure, just different different types. But I mean, f from your perspective, you mentioned there um, uh, cost and, and, and cost of software. How much do you think um, bank budgets might change going forward in terms of just total spend on IT? Is it going to be similar to what we've seen in terms of, you know, huge transformational projects, um, you know, then, you know, sort of ch change the bank budgets looking at, I suppose, um, more sort of innovative systems and, and testing and trialing those systems. And do you, do you see the same sort of levels of spend from banks going forward? Let's say, and I'm, I'm talking like a relatively long time, like over the next sort of mm. 10, 15 years, or do you see actually that some, maybe some banks might move to sort of more subscription models to, you know, reduce their upfront cost of capital, um, even though that they might not have such a deeper presence through the stack, you know, going forward across many years. I'm just kind of interested to know what your mm. thoughts are from sort of a, a, a total perspective. Yeah, another great question. Thank you. So so um, if we look at, um, I guess, the different channels in which they operate, um, clearly, you know, there is a, an absolute digital first agenda in most banks that, that we speak to, because um, it's the best way and the most quickest way, I suppose, to, to reach their customers on a daily basis. But even prior to COVID, um, the way that, you know, I guess consumers are demand, demanding to engage with the customers has already started to change. And there's been all these variables about, you know, which journeys and transactions can I push to online and mobile channels, which journeys are going to still be very relevant um, in the branch. And, and one of those clearly is, you know, the fundamental part of, of uh, historic banking, which is around, you know, your own money and transacting with cash. Um, and we cannot forget, you know, that there are between two and eight million people in the UK and Ireland that would very much struggle without that consistent and regular access to cash. But the role of the branch, I think, is is going to change and move more away from being that that probably destination of pure transactions to being more of a more focused on relationship banking. Um, oh, and we look like we've lost Matt for a third time, but I'm hoping this is going to be as quick as it was before. It yeah, is. Yeah, I'm back. So uh, sorry about that. I don't know um, That's right. what the issue there is, but but um, you know the, the the fundamentals of what a branch is going to become, I think, is a really interesting um, interesting point. And it and I guess back to how we're going to try and help um, our customers, you know, answer that that conundrum and make sure that they're setting up as best they can for the long term because you know investing in branches investing in in people in those branches investing in technology in those branches is is expensive yeah so again you know our, our focus is very much on you know well, let us take some of that tech burden all the way to if you want us to run your entire self-service environment for you we can very much do that um, as a way of of us taking that that tech burden away from the banks um, but I think we'll see a continued investment in in technology, Adam. That's a, that, that's a given. But just given. very much, very much um, focused on driving more agility into the channels and making sure that you know those physical channels are still there for as long as those customers need and need them and uh, and certainly want them, which is what we're seeing today. Yeah, I mean. There's been a lot of talk around sort of the, the, the death of cash, I guess, um, and COVID has only sort of accelerated the, the sort of the um, uh, the amount of consultations and, and, and panels and, and sort of thought leadership around the topic. Uh, Dan Feeney's actually just asked a question as well. Morning, Dan. Um, he's meant he's asked, are post offices really the best replacement for bank branch closures? And I guess just following on from that, and it also follows on from the point we we're just talking about. Do you see sort of bank branches in future becoming more centralised? So actually, instead of you know, we, we, we've looked at, you know, Starling's type with the post office and the post office's role in uh, dispersing cash and benefits in the past. Do you think that that, again, given COVID and the closure of ATMs, the closure of sort of regional bank and, and more obscure bank branches, it, is the emphasis going to become more and more on the post office? And therefore, will the post office be funded adequately by the government in order to fulfil that role? Yeah, another great question. Thanks for that question online there. So, look, the, the post office provides a very valid function and, and you know, still has, a, I guess, a, a bastion of, um, of presence, I guess, in, in perhaps some of the areas where some of the banks no longer are um, and clearly provide a very valid service to, to customers. But what I think we will see is, you know, we've got to think about the evolution of technology and perhaps not just necessarily in a, in a branch location. So where we can take some of the learnings from, 
um, our international friends, um, where the remote uh, devices have become much more than just a cash and dash function. The, the, the offerings, that are the, tra the types of transactions we can now offer at these remote destinations, and a, you know, it could be just a simple device, which could form part of a leave behind strategy for, for a bank. But the, the video interaction, you know, um, recycling of the cash so it's more efficient, being able to take deposits so that, you know, SME customers don't necessarily have to go into the branch. Um, all things that I think we'll see come into the, into the market in the very near term. And then the other side of that is the, the subject of collaboration. And I think what we will see is more collaboration in the industry, starting off with maybe some of the back end functions around uh, potentially the wholesale uh, cash environment. But I think, you know, that that will very quickly migrate into, you know, how do we then collaborate as as FIs to ensure that we're offering the same services consistently to uh, to yeah. the end consumer? Um, but while still maintaining that that differentiation so that if you have a particular brand affinity, you can still have that very much personalized individual service that um, that uh, I guess we're all striving to, to achieve. Yeah, and uh, actually just on that point in terms of l looking at other geographies, uh, Lucy Davis has just um, uh, submitted a question. Thanks very much, Lucy. Uh, oh, we've lost Matt again. I won't start the question until he's back. Let's hope this one's a quick turnaround as well. Here it is. Hi, Matt. Hi. Right. I'm not. I'm not so fast with these dropouts. If they're only about twenty seconds, this is this is good. So I'm I'm fine. It's not necessarily disrupting the flow. So it's all good. Um, Lucy Davis submitted a question. Uh, she said, uh, just following on again from what we were talking about, are there any innovations that we're seeing across the rest of Europe and the world? Uh, obviously, since DN is global, that the UK could take a lead from. So you mentioned there around uh, leave behind strategies and some differencing services uh, when it comes to ATMs. Can you expand on that a little bit more? And is there anything else that you've seen? You know, across certainly sort of um the way to i guess uh serve physical in a digital world if you like um yeah. is there anything that you've particularly looked at you thought wow that's really cool yeah so we're, it was a great question again so thank you so we're seeing um uh, much broader adoption for what we probably call you know the kiosk style uh, device where you know effectively it is a it is a effectively a bank branch but in a device where It'll even, in certain geographies, it'll even give you a, a printer checkbook there and then. It'll emboss and print a card for you with your name on it. So effectively, you can interact with a, a kiosk. Um, you can complete your ID and V um, using that function or maybe even, you know, going on a video chat with a, with a relevant financial institution. Um, and then, you know, you can walk away from that kiosk as a, as a new customer of that FI or indeed, you know, undertake the various transactions that you want to. Um, and then I suppose you know the, the other area is is very much around um, you know some of that that industry collaboration. So we've got some some great learnings from probably some of the more cashless societies, um, and you know where we're talking about in industry innovation, if you like, in perhaps a different way of a, of approaching financial services. You know, being able to um, deliver solutions that that offer our customers, I guess that that more agile approach than they've been historically able to deliver themselves. And that concept, Adam, of what I call sort of platformication. So really being able to harmonize those channels, whereas often today I'm still, you know, perhaps um, interact with a bank in a particular silo and, and treat it in that way. You know, our, our solution is very much focused on, you know, if I'm if I'm Matt Phillips, I want my, my bank to engage with me as Matt Phillips, uh, no matter what channel I choose to interact with them on. And use the data, you know, that, that wealth of data they have to engage with me in a very personal way. Um, and I think you know there are some geographies that are a bit more advanced than we are in the UK and Ireland in, in doing that. So hopefully that answers your question, Lucy. Yeah, and just uh, just on that, and again, Dan's also asked what are DN's favourite biometrics, but that's sort of led me to another question as well, which is, is, is the cost of putting in, because I, I, um, these systems in terms of, I suppose, multifunctional uh, ATM or remote onboarding, uh, you know, f physical centres, but for a, mm. a digital world, if you like, is the, like, um, not, not to get too specific in terms of the business case behind it, but what's kind of the, I guess, the payback period on that? Because that's what, you know, a lot of branch strategies are all around, well, this, you know, our upfront costs are significantly high, but, you know, what's the payback period of having one of these kiosks, I guess, put in, uh, if you know it, uh, or like directionally? Because if you're looking at things like, um, 
you know, what, what biometrics do you use and um, how you do ID and V and how do you ensure security? Mm. Um, I'm assuming there's quite a significant upfront cost, but then there's obviously a, a life cycle, you know, uh, it, it does pay itself back over a certain uh, certain period of time. But do, do you know sort of roughly what that is? Yeah, I mean, it's a, a great question. It, it, it varies very much by, by FI and, and very much in terms of how broad they want those transactions to be. But, you know, we've seen ROI, you know, within within the year, um, Adam. Oh, so, wow. you know, okay. um, and I guess that, as I said, it, it very much is very specific to that individual FI. What? Yeah. Oh, fifth time's a charm. Let's... let's back again um yeah so uh you know what what software um journeys do they want to enable on that device um how do they want to conduct the id and v because different um customers have different processes that they need to adhere to but certainly within within a 12 month time frame but i think um you know equally some of uh you know we've we've got um nearly seventy thousand uh, self-service devices in in the uk and you know, thinking about those in a slightly different way, and the majority of those, uh, you know, actually sit outside of branch locations. Being able to offer those increased transactions at remote locations, I think, is is something that we'll see, and certainly, you know, delivers that that return on investment. Um, and quite frankly, you know, helps the SME market that perhaps can't necessarily get to a branch to to you know complete their uh, perhaps paying in the day's takings. Yeah. Um, and you know, there's advances in software now. We call it pre-staging, whereas often it's the not the the business owner going and paying in the day's takings. In the case of an SME, um, what's to say that you you can't you know pre-stage that transaction using a mobile device, turn up at any um, uh, specific deposit taking ATM, scan a QR code, or or um, or just um, you know ID and V using contactless, make your transaction, get an e receipt, and away you go. I think these are the type of things we'll very much see come into the market to try and, um, as, as you quite rightly said, reduce the uh, the burden on some of the other physical channels. Mm, cool. Okay, we're coming to relative to the top of the hour. Just wanted to ask you one more question, which is just more about Diebold, uh, Nixdorf and, and your role. Sort of, I, I guess sure. over the next 18 months, two years, um, where do you see the company moving into, pivoting into? I mean, you, you guys are... are, are as you said, an enormous company. Um, strategically, is there anything that you wanted to sort of call out to say this is like the focus for the next two years? Yeah, so so I mean, I'm personally speaking, uh, and being responsible for the UK and Ireland, I am a massive advocate of partnerships. Um, and we've worked with some great customers for a number of years, and we, we built, you know, a, a really great level of trust. For me, you know, I think the shift will move more into, you know, us taking more of that tech burden away from our customers more into the managed services and the, and the outsourcing space, right the way to, you know, perhaps banks letting us run their self, self-service self environment for them um, and equally helping them bridge those, those physical and digital channels. Um, I can see, you know, an absolute um, need now and, uh, and equally, you know, I think we'll see more and more of that over the next 18 months to 20, 24 months um, in the UK and Ireland market. So clearly, cool. that's my uh, my focus to to, uh, <laughs> to help our customers in, in that regard and and keep delivering the excellent service that we do day in day out. Matt, thanks so much for joining us. Much much appreciated. Um, thanks I'm glad for having Came back. No, no worried at all. Um, uh, to everybody else, uh, where can they find out about you? So um, obviously, we know you work for, but uh, you personally is the best way to contact you via LinkedIn or Twitter or. Yeah, by all means. So um, yeah, you can uh, perhaps. Look me up on LinkedIn profile. Be great to engage with uh, with anybody who's got an interest in what we've gone through today. So do uh, do connect with me on LinkedIn and by means send me a message, and it'd be great to uh, great to catch up. Bro, um, and thank you so much again for joining. Uh, and that's all that we have for this week. Uh, and in case you guys forgot, obviously Monday is a bank holiday, so we will be back on Tuesday morning. Um, so enjoy the long weekend, and uh, yeah, have a good one. <laughs>